Good afternoon. I'm Valerie Neal, the chair of the Space History Department at the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum in Washington. And we are in the Moving Beyond Earth Exhibition Gallery, which is where we tell some of the stories of the space shuttle era. And today in this program, we will be talking about one of the major incidents in that program. This program is brought to us by Boeing, our corporate sponsor, and we welcome both the audience here in the museum and the audience online. During the program, we'll be talking to the authors of a new book called Bringing Columbia Home. It's the story of the last Space Shuttle Columbia mission and her crew. Uh, during the program, we'll have an opportunity for our audiences to ask questions of the authors, so be thinking about what you might like to know from them. Our guests today are Michael Leinbach and Jonathan Ward. Uh, Mr. Leinbach was a longtime employee of NASA at the Kennedy Space Center, and Mr. Ward has been a longtime aerospace author and consultant. And let's start the program, gentlemen, uh, if we may, by letting you introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about what your history with the space program is. Well, thanks, Valerie. It's great to be here. This is a beautiful setting for, uh, for the interview today. Thank you very much. Well, I started work for NASA in 1984 at the Kennedy Space Center as a structural engineer and, and uh, moved into the operations side of the house after the Challenger accident and became the eighth and final Space Shuttle Launch Director in the year 2000. And in that position, I oversaw all the processing and launch of the space shuttles, gave the final go for all missions from 2000 to the end of the program, all 37 missions. And um, so I have a, a rich history with the space shuttle program. My entire career was space shuttle, and, and uh, I just loved the program, every bit of it. That was an awesome responsibility as launch director. It, uh, yes, it, it was a combination of, of uh, responsibility, but yet uh, pride in the team that I got to represent. Uh, you know, you saw me on TV. What you didn't see were the hundreds of other people, that uh, thousands of other people that processed the shuttle and helped us launch the shuttle. They're the real, they're the real story, the real heroes in this. And Jonathan Ward? I, I'm real happy to be back here again. I uh, used to work as a summer tour guide when I was in high school in the Air and Space Museum back during the Apollo era when it was in, or in the Arts and Industries building. And so it's a thrill for me to be back here again. Uh, longtime resident of the Washington, D.C. area. Moved to North Carolina a while back. But um, it's just, it's uh, what, aerospace and, and this, specifically the space program has been something I've been fascinated about my whole career. And so to get a chance to be able to work with somebody like Mike is a, is a real dream come true on this. And you have already published other books about the space program, haven't you? That's right. I have two other books about the Apollo program and what it was like to work at Kennedy Space Center and, and then how to put together an Apollo mission from the time everything showed up on the dock at Kennedy to the time uh, they launched the, uh, the missions to the moon. So may I ask, how did you two come together? How did you find each other and embark on this project together? Well, we met, uh, as luck would have it, at, at a memorial service for a mutual friend. Uh, the, the, uh, the man that hired me into the NASA test director's office, Norm Carlson, had passed. Good, good family friend, not just my boss. And, and Jonathan had worked with Norm on, on his two Apollo books, and we met at, at Norm's memorial service. And, and uh, the rest, they say, is, is, is history. It's history. Norm told me that Mike was the best hire he'd ever made, and I never got a chance to meet Mike. And then I saw him there at the memorial service, and we went over and I, I introduced myself, and we decided to go out and have a drink together out at uh, a local uh, watering hole and remember Norm, and then the two of us got to talking about it. And, one thing led to another, as they said. So that was the germ of the idea yeah. on that day. That's yeah. very appropriate. That's right. Um, well, let's go back in time uh, to February 1st, Saturday morning in 2003. Uh, some of us remember that day quite clearly. Perhaps others uh, weren't yet aware of the space program at that point. But uh, can you set the scene for us? Uh, what happened that morning? And then we'll talk about what, what happened beyond that, what okay. developed from that. Well, February 1st, 2003, landing day of a space shuttle mission was always a, a day of celebration at the Kennedy Space Center. We were going to be welcoming back our friends, our seven astronaut friends. Their families were in town to welcome their loved ones home. 
uh, a lot of family and friends next to the uh, shuttle landing facility to see our crew come home safely after a good 16-day mission. Uh, me personally, I'd, I'd gone to the Launch Control Center and watched the deorbit burn for my console uh, in the LCC, and, and that went fine. And what that set us up for was a landing of the space shuttle at Kennedy Space Center exactly an hour later. And so I got in my car and went out to the runway to, to meet the rest of my friends and the administrator and other folks and, and uh, waited for Columbia to come home. Uh, the first cues we got that something was terribly wrong uh, are, were calls from Mission Control in Houston to the commander, Rick Husband, that went unanswered. And then three minutes and 15 seconds prior to, to landing, the space shuttle always produced a double sonic boom, physical phenomenon you, you just cannot avoid. And we didn't hear those double sonic booms. And then between us and the runway was a, was a countdown clock, and it, it reached uh, zero, zero, zero on the clock, and Columbia should have been right in front of us, and it wasn't. And so we knew right then that uh, it was going to be a terrible day. All we knew at that time was Columbia was somewhere between orbit and the Kennedy Space Center, but we had no idea where it was. And um, it was just a completely empty feeling. It, it, uh, the, the, the space shuttle could not have landed safely anywhere else. And so intellectually, we knew we were, we were having a very bad day, probably holding out hope that something miraculous might happen, but uh, of course it didn't. With each passing minute, you knew something miraculous couldn't happen? No, it, it just couldn't happen. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then we, we got a, a few of the senior leaders together in my office in the LCC and turned on the television feed from CNN, and then we saw the streaks in the sky above Texas. and. And then we knew conclusively that, uh, that the Columbia and the crew was lost. And Jonathan, on that day, were you aware of what was going on too? Um, I was like millions of other people probably thinking that everything was going to go fine with that landing. Um, I had another appointment I had to be at that morning at the scheduled landing time, and, but again, thought nothing was going to be unusual about it. And uh, when I left the appointment, got in my car and turned on the radio and, and heard the news that uh, Columbia had been lost at this point. It was probably a little less than an hour after the accident and I uh, was just emotionally devastated, had to pull over to the side of the road and, and collect my thoughts. Mm -hmm. So at this point, um, within that first hour, there was a tremendous amount of uncertainty uh, and probably dread and maybe a dawning awareness of what might have happened. but. Uh, can we approach this a little bit as a detective story now and have you walk us through what ensued after the accident uh, over the next few days, and beyond that, weeks and months, uh, to figure out what had actually happened? Sure. Um, we had, uh, NASA has a contingency plan uh, for such accidents, although we never envisioned a landing accident. And our plan is very general in nature, but, but uh, Bill Reedy was Associate Administrator of NASA at the time, and he had that plan in hand and pulled it out, and, and we started working through a, a, a very, very top-level checklist. And it included things like uh, our administrator calling the president, uh, naming a, a, a lead NASA official for the contingency itself. So we went through those steps. Um, all the while not knowing exactly where Columbia was and exactly what had happened to the crew. We knew they were, they were lost at this, at this stage. Um, one, of the plan, one, of the, one of the procedures in the plan was to, uh, to send out a, a, a team from the Kennedy Space Center anywhere in the world that the, that the shuttle came down. And so I led that team out to, uh, to the Barksdale Air Force Base that evening. But concurrent with that, concurrent with that first meeting that we, that we were having in the LCC, the debris was coming down in, in East Texas, and maybe Jonathan can talk about that. It, it, uh, we didn't know where it was, and the good people in East Texas were surrounded by noises and, and sounds they'd never heard before. They didn't know what it was. Yeah, it was just uh, talking to the people who were out there along the path where Columbia came down. You know, we saw the streaks on TV, but there was no sound associated with that, that video. For the people along about a 250 mile long path from Dallas to, to uh, Fort Polk, Louisiana, they heard uh, a continuous series of rumbling and banging and, and uh, booms that shook their houses to their foundations in some cases. 
and what it turned out to be was 84,000 pieces of the shuttle coming down, each one of which was breaking the sound barrier. And so you just had this continuous series of sonic booms that lasted for minutes. And uh, you know, people stepped outside. Uh, one person we talked to said he was convinced that uh, an atomic bomb had just blown up Houston or, or uh, New Orleans. Somebody else thought that two planes had collided or that there were a pipeline had exploded. One person said he figured it was Judgment Day and he stepped outside to meet Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, but the people saw smoke trails going through the air. They heard sounds like helicopter blades whizzing through. You know, things were coming down around them. And miraculously, nobody on the ground was hurt. And it was just a, a, a tremendous period of uncertainty for them as this kind of thing was happening. A lot of people there were not even aware that there was a space shuttle in orbit, let alone one coming down overhead at that time. The last thing people would have expected. Yeah. So you led a team to Barksdale Air Force Base, which is in Louisiana, but very close to that debris path yes. and the path of the orbiter coming back. As you and the NASA crew were getting set up, what else was happening? This, this begins the, the good news story, if, if there is one, of the Columbia accident, and it, it's the first responders in East Texas that, that uh, out of the goodness of their heart and knowing what, what was the right thing to do, started helping us before we even asked them to help us. And, and uh, the local town's officials, the sheriffs, the funeral directors, the volunteer fire department folks, they all, they all just chipped in and just started um, pulling together a plan while we were pulling together the NASA plan. They were on the field, they were in the field on, on their feet actually dealing with debris and, and our astronauts. Yeah, it was, it was uh, an interesting uh, challenge to try to pull together all of these different pieces because there was this convergence of efforts that were going on. Mike and his team coming from Kennedy Space Center, the astronauts coming up from Houston, FEMA coming down to, to take charge of the, of the situation, the EPA on the ground to handle things like this uh, the sphere of, of uh, toxic propellants that had hit the ground near houses. Um, and it was the local responders who first started taking charge of that situation until all of these agencies could come together. By the end of that first day, more than 100 federal and state agencies had come together in the Civic Center at Lufkin, Texas to start taking charge of that operation. But meanwhile, as Mike said, there were volunteers out in the field. The first remains of Columbia's crew had already been found within a couple hours of the accident. And so it became clear that this was a much more serious type of situation that was originally even anticipated for the people on the ground there. And so the locals uh, jumped in tremendously uh, to start organizing search parties to go out and see what they could do to, to try to help bring the astronauts back. So everybody is arriving, everybody's willing and eager to help. Uh, how do you bring order to that kind of effort so that you can accomplish what you need to accomplish? Did you have certain priorities that you set in terms of the debris you wanted to find? Uh, what were those priorities? Yeah, one of the, one of the key aspects of leadership <laughs> is, is to bring order out of chaos. Mm -hmm. and, and those of us back at Kennedy in the first couple of hours, it, it was chaos, but a very, very quiet, subdued chaos. Chaos in Texas was real. It was, it was debris falling out of the sky. So we, we established a criteria for the, for the folks on the ground. Uh, our three top priorities were one, protection of the public. Second was to recover the astronauts. And third was to recover the space shuttle herself. And, um, you know, we didn't want to hurt anybody on the ground. It, it was miraculous that we didn't hurt anybody on the ground. Uh, pieces were coming through uh, garage roofs. One piece went through a school roof and landed by a teacher's desk. Mm -hmm. But it was a Saturday morning. School was not in session. Uh, but we went out and, and, and looked for those pieces like that sphere that you saw on, on the screen and, and protected it, kept people away. Um, we issued, uh, be on the lookout for, uh, for, for lack of a better term, uh, these types of materials and to stay away from them. We were particularly interested in, of course, the astronauts and, and any kind of data recording devices that could help us solve the, solve the mystery of what happened to Columbia. And um, people started flagging the locations of debris, being careful not to touch it, but flagging it, right. um, and reporting back to you, reporting back to FEMA, reporting back to EPA. Can you talk a little bit about the um, different roles that the different agencies had since there were 100, 150 agencies there? 
what were the roles of the principal agencies and uh, how did NASA yeah. interact with them? Yeah. You know, there was, it was kind of a triumvirate. It was FEMA, EPA, and NASA were the main three agencies that were working on this out of, uh, out of Lufkin. FEMA was re overall responsible for the disaster response to the, to the local communities. NASA was in charge of the accident investigation and bringing the pieces back. And the EPA was in charge of protecting the public and, and uh, decontaminating every piece of, of, of uh, debris that was found. So that when these search teams were organized, and later on when the, Nash, uh, the uh, U.S. Forest Service began running these, these uh, search teams, there was always an EPA person and always a NASA person that went along with all of these search crews to try to help out uh, and, and to do their roles. And just to, to, to make the roles. point, uh, some of the propellants on the shuttle were extremely toxic, uh, so you didn't know whether propellants might be leaking out of damaged equipment. Mm -hmm. Really didn't want people approaching too close. Uh, there were explosives on board, which uh, normally would be used only in an emergency to drop the landing gear or uh, blow a hatch or something, but you didn't know what condition those explosives were in. So, um, that's why public safety was your number one priority, right? And people were showing up actually bringing in, hey, look what I found, and bringing in live explosives to the uh, collection centers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Yeah. Um, but as you said, miraculously, no one was injured, no person was injured by the debris falling from the sky, mm -hmm. and only a few pieces of property were damaged. Uh, just to give some context to this debris falling from the sky, um, we saw a picture a moment ago of the powerhead of an engine that plowed into the earth and was buried 14 feet deep. How high was the shuttle and how fast was it going when it disintegrated? Well, we had the, uh, the breach in the wing that was caused by the foam that came off the external tank during, during launch. And when the shuttle came back in, the hot plasma gas got inside the left wing through some breach, which we, we will never know what the breach looked like, and melted the wing from the inside out, and it also compromised the hydraulic system, so we didn't have any steering. That all occurred around 200,000 feet at Mach 16, um, 20,000 miles per hour, roughly. Um, no, not that fast, about 16,000 miles per hour, I'm sorry. Um, and um, it, it it went into a flat spin and broke up aer aerodynamically. It came down in an area over 250 miles long, uh, 20 miles wide, was our initial debris field. Uh, I remember like it was yesterday, we had a big map on the wall of, of, the, of a hangar at the Barksdale Air Force Base where we first set up and we were taking those little colored push pins. And as debris was called in, we would just plot these, the, the location of these pieces of debris and we started getting a sense of where, where Columbia was. Um, and then it just, it just re, uh, resolved over the next few days of what types of people we needed to go out and, and, and locate the debris. We, we did GPS recording of each piece of debris. As Jonathan said, we found over 84,000 pieces of Columbia over the course of the next three months and brought it back to the Kennedy Space Center to, um, to learn what happened to the orbiter from the debris, to, from the debris alone. And we'll talk about that activity at Kennedy Space Center in a minute. But before we leave these small towns mm -hmm. in sure. Texas, yeah. uh, can you tell us more about uh, the response to this tragedy in these small towns as 25,000 searchers uh, descended upon them? Yeah, it was one of the, the, uh, the, the, the most interesting parts of this for me was going out and talking to the people in Hemp Hill, Texas, which is in Sabine County, which is right on the Louisiana border. And they were kind of ground zero for where the crew came down and where a lot of the crew compartment for the shuttle and the heavier pieces of the, of the crew module came down. Um, and there was, a, I think, less than, less than 10,000 people in the county altogether, about 1,000 people in the town, and the population of the town tripled overnight as all these searchers started coming in, as all these TV crews started coming in. Um, and they, you know, the, no place for people to, no p place for people to sleep. We, NASA had people sleeping in fish camps. Uh, people were sleeping in cars. The folks there in Hemp Hill opened their houses. Um, they they uh, said, you know, come on, stay at my place. Let me do your laundry for you. The VFW hall became kind of like the central place where the feeding of the, uh, of the search team started going on there. and. Uh, the wife of the VFW commander uh, 
organized a, a volunteer feeding effort and in the course of the first 12 days after the accident fed somewhere between 30,000 and 60,000 meals um, at no cost to the government. This was all just people from the local communities bringing in food. Kids were, were making sandwiches. A teacher thought it would be a great learning experience for her kids to make sandwiches for the searchers. So she brought in loaves of bread and, and food, had the kids make sandwiches and put little notes to the searchers in, in each of those little lunches that went out. And a lot of the searchers we talked to said they still keep those, those pieces of paper because they, uh, they were so deeply meaningful to them back in those really hard times. That is a really heartwarming story of how people come together under duress mm -hmm. and just open-heartedly help. Um, you also had some interesting members of search parties. I think you had a lot of wildfire fighters and you had a group of Native Americans who came in and brought some special skills with them. Can yeah. you talk a little yeah. bit about yeah. that? I mean, this, after the, the last of the crew was found, and this was on the 12th of February, uh, NASA, you know, there was obviously a, 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 a tremendous collective sigh of relief that we had found the crew. Um, and there was thoughts that there was no need to continue to put people in harm's way to bring the rest of, the, of Columbia back again. And so they were looking for professionals that could help search that, that tremendous debris path. And someone mentioned, uh, someone in the Texas Forest Service said, hey, wildfire fighters are trained to walk in and do grid searching. Why don't we bring in those people? They can come in as self-contained teams. And so over the course of the next two and a half months, 25,000 or so uh, search crews were, uh, were people from search crews were brought in from 42 states to help out. And a lot of them were from Native American reservations. And uh, you know they came in, they worked in teams of 20, again, accompanied by an EPA and a NASA person. And they stayed in four camps along the debris uh, path uh, in Texas. So it was, it was quite an interesting array of people. And again, talking to those folks, they say this was probably the singular most important thing they felt they ever did in their life was helping out with the search. And it was the largest search and recovery operation in U.S. history, wasn't it? it was. Yes, indeed, yes. We ended up walking an area 10, 10 miles wide by 120 miles long. So just in your mind, put together a, a huge rectangle of those dimensions, and that's the size of the, the land that we physically walked to look for the, for the debris. And it was not all pasture land, right? Uh, hardly. <laughs> it was uh, very thick thorns and through mud and streams and ponds and and uh, pine forests that uh, it was anything but accommodating and, and uh, people were ripping up their clothes. One, one lady ended up buying a lot of duct tape and, and wrapping it around her legs and her arms and, uh, just to protect their clothing, her clothing, uh, to keep it from ripping off in just the first mm -hmm. few hours. Oh, well, let's uh, move now to Kennedy Space Center. As, as the uh, search was well underway then, you had a new responsibility at Kennedy Space Center. And can you tell us about that phase of the uh, recovery effort? Sure. We, um, I was asked to go back to the Kennedy Space Center and, and uh, do what we call a reconstruction of the debris to, to figure out what happened to the orbiter based solely on the debris. But it wasn't a reconstruction like you, like you think. Uh, we, we took the pieces of the belly of the orbiter and the left wing where we knew the breach had, had occurred initially and studied those in detail. Uh, the rest of the orbiter we, we had on the sides of, a, of an old uh, empty hangar that we rented for the job. And, um, and, and the National Transportation Safety Board was tremendous through this whole effort. They, they, they uh, asked us to put together two teams, one team to study the debris like you see on the, on the screen, and another team to study all the, uh, all the data, all the video that the public has sent in, uh, data from the orbiter itself, and if those two teams concluded the same cause of the accident, well then that indeed was the, uh, was the cause, and, and we both did, and, and we were able to fix the problem and move on and fly the shuttle again. And you were able to confirm conclusively that there had been damage to the left wing and even pinpoint pretty accurately where that damage had occurred. Right? Yes, we did. Uh, based on the debris, we could see where, where the breach was and, and which direction the hot plasma gas went and which materials were melted first, second, third, that type of thing. Quite a, quite a feat of forensic engineering, I think. Well, I always like to tell folks that uh, if you could separate the emotion from the engineering, it was a, it was a very, very interesting engineering problem. The problem is you can't separate the emotion from it. We lost seven of our friends in our mm -hmm. orbiter, uh, and, and so we just couldn't separate the emotion from it. It had to be somber duty. Um, 
So could I ask you, um, what was the most challenging part of all this for you uh, personally? Oh, personally, I think was was to help the team get through those tough emotional times. Uh, whenever somebody came into the hangar for the first time to see the debris, invariably they would break down. Uh, and even people that had worked in the hangar for weeks or months uh, occasionally would break down. And, and uh, the picture you see on the screen, that's the belly of the orbiter with the nose at the bottom of the screen laid upside down. There's the left wing. Um, and so our, our folks were, were really dealing with the emotion and, and we tried to find ways to come together as a team and, and uh, we went to a minor league ball game together. We had a picnic towards the end of the, of the effort together. Anything that we could do to, to, uh, to take the mind off of the, off of the tragedy every now and then. Um, you, you couldn't get away from it, but you, but you had to deal with it. And, and, I, and I think as the leader of the hangar, that was my most difficult challenge. Um, let's switch to the audience for a moment and see if we have uh, some questions among our visitors here or any questions coming in from online. Oh, we have a microphone here if you uh, wish to ask a question. Uh, just step up at any point and uh, we'll recognize you. There we go. And while we wait for that, um, uh, while we wait for someone to come to the microphone, um, I'll just ask you, Jonathan, mm -hmm. what was the most challenging part to you of writing this story? Well, Mike and I, from the very outset, when we talked about how we wanted to tell the story, we didn't want to do any finger pointing. We didn't want to be anything uh, that was going to be too hard for people to read. It, it, emotions are hard enough as it is. Uh, we didn't want to say anything that hadn't already been said before. In a lot of cases, we pulled back from, from things that had been let up before. Our primary concern was, was being uh, careful with the, what the crew, and how the crew was handled, and, because we wanted the crew families to think that this was handled with respect and dignity. And uh, yeah, and so, so for me, that was the, the tough thing, was to make sure we kept this completely, um, you know, it, to be as respectful as we possibly could in this process. So. All right, I see we have a question here. Welcome, sir. What would you like to know? Like you did a phenomenal job of finding out exactly where the impact was and the damage to the wing. But how did they figure out what caused that impact and that damage to that wing? It's, was it how done off a of video? How did you figure out what had caused or? the damage? We, we had some video of, of the orbiter during ascent. Uh, and we were able to, uh, to look at two different cameras and we saw a piece of foam come off the external tank and, and impact the, the left wing at some location. We had a couple of issues with our video that day of launch. One camera was inoperative, another one was out of focus, but we took the two that we had, the two best views that we had, and we knew we had an, an impact somewhere in the leading edge. Uh, Again, we didn't know how bad it was. We, we had had impacts from foam before on the orbiter and rationalized to ourselves during the first week of the mission that this was probably just another foam hit and it might be a turnaround issue where we'd have to repair some tiles, that type of thing, but it, it didn't represent a, a safety of flight issue to the crew. Um, we were wrong. And I just wanted to point out that there's actually a, a model of the piece of foam that came off right over here on the wall back there. So I would encourage you after the, the talk here to go over and take a look at that. That's the size of the piece that, that it was only, only weighed a pound, but it was enough to punch a hole through the wing. One, one of the things we did, if I could follow on a little bit, uh, knowing that that foam came off that area to, uh, for a return to flight, we ended up taking that foam off intentionally and wrapping that joint with heat tape to keep ice from forming at that joint. And uh, that was our ultimate solution to the problem. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, just to uh, begin to wrap up, can I ask you what you think is the most important lesson learned uh, from the analysis of the Columbia uh, tragedy? Lesson learned, uh, uh, it, it, it harkens back to Challenger, the loss of Challenger as well. And, and it, it deals with listening to people who have concerns and don't assume that, that their concern is, is, is uh, irrational or, or irrelevant. Uh, we'd become somewhat complacent in the shuttle program because we had those hits before. We'd become overconfident. And those are two things you can't do in manned spaceflight. And, and so the, the, le the big lesson learned is when people have issues, have concerns about the direction a, a program or decisions are headed, listen to everybody and get as much data as you possibly can before you make that final decision. 
And I suspect you're often asked, might there have been a chance of rescue had the problem been recognized right away after the launch? Yeah, we get asked that. And um, the answer is if, if we had known on the second day of the mission that Columbia was, was uh, damaged, irreparably damaged, we could have launched Atlantis and gotten to the crew in time. But that would have required unrealistic assumptions during Columbia's first couple of days of her mission, something way beyond what the shuttle program and NASA would have, would have reasonably done. Um, and so while the timeline lays out that we could have launched Atlantis and gotten up there in time, they're just unrealistic assumptions to, to get there. And, and uh, so we, we, uh, we rest assured that, uh, that uh, um, you know, we didn't, we didn't have a chance at the rescue mission. And, and certainly wish we'd had because I know NASA would have pulled out all the stops to try to go rescue our seven friends. Well, uh, that is a somber note to end on, but, but hmm. perhaps a, a good note to end on because it suggests that in the future of human space flight, ideally uh, new teams, new launch directors, new crews will be aware of these potential weaknesses and will take to heart the lessons of both the Challenger and the Columbia tragedies. And I, I think they were tragedies uh, because they were preventable. Yes, both um, of them. It's just, you know, if we knew then what we know now, they might have been prevented. Uh, I would like to thank both of you gentlemen for being here with us today and, and talking about this difficult subject. Uh, it's an important story to have been told, and, and it's good that you had both told it. So would the audience join me in thanking Michael Wayne and Jonathan Ward. Uh, yeah. I would like to also thank our audience here in the museum and our online audience, and as well thank Boeing for providing the sponsorship for programs like this. I would also like to remark that uh, there will be a book signing uh, as soon as we can get these gentlemen to the uh, museum store. Uh, this book is available there and they will be with us for an hour or so uh, to talk with you about their book or to sign a copy if you wish to uh, purchase one. Um, thank you again for being with us. Thank you especially for doing this book. I think it's a fine tribute to Columbia the vehicle, uh, the last crew of Columbia and to all of the people who were involved in its recovery. Thank you. Thank you, Valerie.